Thank you. No, I'll go back and help myself afterwards. We'll call the Wilmer City Council work session for Monday, June 5th to order. First item on the agenda is public comment. We have one person that, who has uh, signed up for that. So Tara, if you could come to the podium, introduce yourself, uh, street address, uh, not necessarily to give us your phone number. Do you live in Wilmer? I do not, but okay, I- Okay, that's um, fine. Oh, sorry. Um, so good afternoon, my name is Tara Fugate, um, and I'm the strategic researcher with the Minnesota Nurses Association. And I'm here along with some concerned m and members from Rice Memorial Hospital to discuss um, and give some comments about the proposed affiliation with Centricare. Um, and you're gonna hear some concerns and personal testimony from nurses um, later as we're on the agenda. Uh, however, I'd like to begin by bringing your attention to the very serious implications that this deal may have for the dedicated nurses um, as a researcher, I've been exploring the potential consequences of this deal in terms of the impact on the um, public employee pension benefits. Uh, currently, the nurses and other staff at Rice Memorial are covered under the Public Employee Retirement Association of Minnesota, or PARA, um, and it is exceedingly likely that these nurses will lose that pension benefit if this deal is not entered into with care and consideration. Um, over the past 16 years, over 30 public agencies, mainly hospitals and healthcare facilities in Minnesota have gone through privatization. Um, and it's important for me to emphasize that privatization is not interchangeable with sale. I understand that the hospital administration has been emphatic that this is not a sale, but an affiliation or lease agreement uh, does not preclude privatization in the eyes of PARA. Uh, in fact, at MA, we've seen affiliation uh, result in M&A members losing their pensions in the past. <clears throat> so the defining factor in these agreements in these agreements is who maintains payer status over the hospital employees. If that responsibility is transferred to Centricare, the employees that have dedicated their lives to serving this community with care will have an infinitely more difficult time retiring with dignity. Uh, they will lose their pensions, which can never which can never be fully replaced by a market-driven 401k. Um, and so if there is a way in which this partnership can be made with the city retaining formal ownership and payer status over the hospital, we hope that that avenue would be considered. Um, and even if privatization of Rice Memorial is inevitable, there are protections that can be afforded uh, to the nurses and other employees if sought out. So for example, Minnesota statute, state statute chapter 353F provides enhanced deferred uh, benefits for para members who no longer qualify as active members of the association because of privatization. A medical facility that is transferred to private ownership can approach para for inclusion under the provisions of the statute, but I wanna emphasize that this is not an automatic process, nor is it le a legal requirement. So the privatizing entity, in this case, Centricare, must approach para and work with their actuaries in order to provide this benefit to nurses and the other employees at the hospital. Um, so I urge you as city councilors to question and explore the impact of this deal on the nurses and other employees who provide high quality care at Rice Memorial and are very proud to work at a dedicated community hospital. Uh, please include nurses and other employees in conversations about the content of this affiliation as it will impact not only their patients and their practice, but their future uh, retirement opportunities as well. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to make comments under the public comment portion of the meeting? Seeing and hearing none, we'll go to the first item on the agenda, which is the sewer backup property damage at 1016 Southwest 17th Street Southwest. I have copies of letters and pictures for almost everybody. Would you if you could give them to the city administrator, he'll make sure they get distributed. My name is Alberta Johnson, my husband Eugene, and we live at 1016 17th Street Southwest in Wilmer. Uh, we've lived here for since June of 2010. Mm -hmm. We moved from Florida to Minnesota, backwards. At approximately 625 on April 3rd, 2017, I heard a gurgling noise in my kitchen. I thought at first it might be an I the ice maker on the refrigerator. It was not, so I turned the light on for the basement to check there. There it is when I saw water on the floor. I went down and there was water coming up out of the main drain. It was like almost like a fountain gushing up. 
I called my husband who came back home from work and shut off our water supply and made sure that our sump pump was working. I called Nielsen's Plumbing and was informed that he was in Arizona and he suggested that I call Wilmer Plumbing and Heating. I spoke with a man named Gary at 6.59. Steve from Wilmer Plumbing called about 7.30 and said he was on his way. After looking at the situation, he commented that he did not think it was our problem because of the way the water was coming up through the drain. He used a snake or a cable to put down our drain. He said that he'd gone out approximately 100 feet and felt nothing. He said he ran it out to the main sewer line and he thought the water was coming in from the main sewer line in the road. He called someone from the city, Wil uh, Wilmer City. I don't know who it was that he called. I'm not sure who came out because I left and went to work. My husband stayed there with the plumber. My husband told me that they opened the manhole cover, which is just to the north of our house. He opened the manhole and said they had a problem because there was water in the manhole. He called a crew from Public Works and they came and blew out the sewer line from Wilmer Avenue. As soon as they took care of it from Wilmer Avenue, the water stopped coming into our house and started flowing out. The man from the city went down the street, 17th Street, toward Wilmer Avenue and put a green mark, and there is a picture of the green mark, on the road where he said there had been a blockage before and he felt the blockage was there again. We had contaminated sewer water throughout most of our basement. In some areas, it was about two to three inches deep. Service Master was originally called on Monday, but through Steve of Wilmer Plumber, we heard about a company named A1 Cleaning that we eventually went with. Service Master wanted almost $9,000 to do the work. That was just to tear it out. They weren't gonna put anything back. As soon as we found out that the city was sewer was plugged, my husband called the city and spoke with Judy Thompson, who told us to bring in pictures. The following day, we received a phone call from Mark Evanson, who said he was the adjuster for city insurance company. He said he did not have a claim number yet, but was giving us a call as a courtesy. Basically, the first words out of his mouth were, just because you have water in your basement does not mean the city is liable. When I asked him what he meant, he said he has to review all the records from the city to check to see if they were maintaining the sewers properly. He said that he, it, that would take a few weeks and he had 30 days to complete it. He told me to go ahead and do whatever was necessary to get the mess cleaned up. I was upset with the fact that basically he was telling me there was no way the city was going to um, be responsible for... Uh, because we had water in our basement. He did not come to our house until Thursday to inspect things. I asked him if he wanted to see my pictures because everything had already been removed from the basement and the sewer had been cleaned up. His response to me about the pictures was no. He could see we had water damage. Once again, he would have to prove liability on the city's part because before they would pay. I asked him how we could be reliable or liable because the city sewer backed up into our home. He said the city could not be responsible for Johnny's mom throwing a, toilet, a diaper in the toilet. We waited a couple of weeks and had not heard anything from Mark Evanson, so we called again. He said he was just about complete with things. A couple of days later, he called and said we would be receiving a letter stating that as far as he could tell, the city was not responsible for any water damage to our home. We did receive that letter, and there's a copy attached. On Tuesday, April 25th, my husband attended a union meeting where Marv Kelvin was there to answer questions. My husband spoke to Mr. Kelvin, who took a copy of the letter we had prepared. A councilwoman named Julie Osmus was there also, who took a copy of the letter on her phone. Both said they would get back to him. Mr. Calvin suggested that we contact the new city ma manager, Ike Holland, and let him address the issues. He said give him a few days as he was just getting on board with the city. I contacted him and he spoke to me on the phone and asked that I drop off copies of the pictures. On April 30th, I did that. Marv Kelvin did call my husband and said that they had turned things over to Public Works. On May 15th, I received another phone call from Mark Evanson, who said he was calling because I needed clarification on why he said the city was not liable for our damage. I turned the phone call over to my husband, who then spoke to him and listened while he again told him why the city was not responsible. 
At that time, Mark Evanson called. We were in Virginia attending our granddaughter's college graduation. When I returned home on the 18th of May, I called the city manager's office again and did not receive any response back. I finally spoke to his assistant and asked what the problem was. I told her I was very upset because I had given him information and all he did was turn it over to the insurance adjuster who said the city was not responsible. She listened to me and then she said that I Collin had turned it over to Sean with the public works. She was going to check with Sean and get back to me. She called me back a few minutes later and said she was very sorry, but no one in the city was allowed to speak with me regarding the issue. I was flabbergasted as to why. And she said the insurance adjuster had told him not to speak with us regarding it as it was an issue for the insurance company. I felt our only recourse was to get an attorney involved. This is not what we want to do. It is costly to both sides of the issue. I decided to contact my city councilman. Since Julie had been at the union meeting on June to April 25th, I looked up her contact information online and left a message for her. I never received a phone call. I also emailed her as to when the next city council meeting was, and she did receive a response <coughs> that it was June 5th. I do thank you for that. From another source, I found out that I could asked to be put on the agenda for the city council meeting, which was June 5th. I called the city manager and emailed him as to being put on the agenda. He responded to both the phone call and the email and put us on the agenda. I understand if we had gotten a lot of rain or a superabundance of snow that was melting all at once that we might get some blockage, as happened last fall when we received about eight inches of rain and many people in the city had water in their basement. We did not get one drop of water in our basement at that time. My question to you is, if the city is not responsible for Johnny's mom putting a diaper in the toilet, am I? We do not have an option as to whether we hook up to the city sewer or not. We must pay for the use of the sewer. I, if I am expected to pay for the sewer, do not, I not have the right to expect that it is going to not come into my home? This is not a day, there is not a day that goes by that I am not scared that I will look again at my basement and see the black sewage bef that I saw before and that I will have to go through this all again. We've had to completely replace all of the carpeting, flooring, baseboard, do door moldings, and one door. And I've listed a bunch of the costs. We've done this with a loan that we had to take out. Alberta, if you want to stay at the, at the podium in case there's some that would like to ask you a question. <clears throat> um, Council, you've received the information in the packet in regards to this along with the letter from the, uh, the city, uh, Mark Evenson, the claims adjuster. Um, Cornell Elker Agency is the, uh, is the party involved. We also have some additional documentation there of um, the, the, the information that was provided to uh, them from the information that we received from Mr. Letterbore, who was a public works superintendent at the time. Um, first off, let me just tell you that, you know, when I originally talked to your husband at the union meeting, that you were, which you were referencing in your letter, um, you know, I did request that you speak with Mr. Holland. Yes, you did. And, um, and so thank you for following up on that. I know it took a little bit of time to get back with you, but he was in the process of moving here and uh, right. going to his family's no, graduation and getting right back. No, he got back right away, so. right after that. But then when he, I got back from vacation, and then I called, and I think I left a couple messages, and sure. that's when he didn't return the call, and that's when I talked to his assistant, who told me that they were not, no one in the city was allowed to talk to me. Sure. And, and that so, I don't understand. Right. And so what ends up happening in these situations is when they get turned over to the attorneys, the attorneys a lot of times, well, I'm sorry, the uh, insurance adjusters, a lot of times they want to know all the correspondence that's happening so that it doesn't end up being a he said, we said, she said thing. But he basically so. blew us off from the very moment I spoke with him on the phone. I knew from the minute I spoke with him, and he's your city, your adjuster, so I understand he's only looking out for you. But 
where do we go and what do we do to have somebody come in? How do I know the city records were maintained properly? I never saw them. Sure. And they obviously weren't because there was a blockage twice in the very same spot. They marked it the second time. When he came out that morning, he said he put a green mark on the road and said, this is where it was blocked before. So the things that the city looks at is, first off, we have to have a maintenance program. And the maintenance program that we have is an approved maintenance program that the city uses. It follows industry standards, and we do that. Um, we can't predict whether or not there are, a blockage will occur or not. We, we, you know, we just cannot uh, predict that. If something goes down into the storm sewer, I mean into the sanitary sewer and blocks it, there's no way the city can be aware of that. You know, you did the right thing by calling your husband, your husband coming in right away and getting a hold of us. I think our staff, if you look at the times you have documented here, our, time, our, our, our staff responded very appropriately. And it's a sad state of affairs that this happens, but uh, the city administrator and I met this afternoon in regards to this issue. And the position that the city has is that if we follow the procedures as outlined by industry standards and we do that and document that, um, and I guess that's where a little trust comes, you know, I mean, we have city employees that do a great job, that are out there every day working hard, and I trust them. You know, I, I live in Wilmer. And I don't as, anymore. Yeah, I'm sorry I, I live in that. Wilmer, too, and I'm sorry. I don't trust them anymore. I'm the one that had to live with the basement. I'm the one that had to smell it for days. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that ended up with a sinus infection because of it. So, no, I don't trust them anymore. I, you can trust them all you want. Sure. But do I trust that because now twice in the very same spot they've had a blockage that there isn't any guarantee that that's not going to happen two years from now and I'm going to have the same problem? Right. And so what, I, what I'm here to tell you is that, that we're sorry this happened, but at, at this point there's nothing the city can do about it. So, so we thank you for coming. I've got so. a question for you because we lived in Florida and they had backflow valves so they couldn't have them. Yeah, you certainly could install a backflow valve, yeah. well, right, Sean? When, when am I supposed to know about that? I mean, I bought the house, and I hooked up to the city sewer. Eugene, could you? The city, when they put a sewer in, would protect themselves from that. Eugene, could you? Yeah. They should have the backflow valve in there. Why didn't they put the sewer in? Yeah. Yeah. Eugene, could you give me a call? If we're going to have you speak, I'd like you to come to the because we're recorded, because there are probably some people that will listen to this in the future and. So basically what Mr. What Mr. Uh, Johnson is saying is that the city should look at installing backflow preventers on the sewer system. So um, is there anybody from the council that wishes to make a comment at all? Ron? I mean, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, Ron. <laughs> We're in the informal portion. Okay. Um, thank you for bringing this to our attention. Um, you know, the, uh, all the policies and rules and regulations that we have to uh, abide by are guidelines. And we can bend those guidelines. That's why we have uh, conditional use permits and variances in the city. And I read through what the insurance company sent us, the uh, documents on here, and I, I has, I'm wondering, has this ever happened before in Walmart, and, and can we not somehow help these folks out. You know, you know, we, all these companies that come to town with millions of dollars, we give them tax abatement, TIF districts, and, and we leave our own people behind. And once again, I'll remind the council, we're here to represent these people and everyone else who pays taxes in the city. And, and so many times we leave them behind. I, I feel for you, and I, I, I've read what the uh, insurance company has said, but can we not bend this somehow and help these folks out? Um, I know it might be setting a precedent. However, um, we're here to help these folks. We're, we're, I hate turning a blind eye and saying it's all over with and there's nothing we can do. I, I, I think we need to discuss, and that's my question. Can we not somehow help these folks out, uh, whether it's uh, uh, putting in this backflow valve or, uh, or even helping pay for some of this? I mean, I, I, I see this over and over again where we give these people with all the kinds of money breaks coming into the city. And then when it comes to help, helping out a local resident who's paying taxes here and been here for a while, we say, oops, sorry, the, the rules say we can't do this. Is it not something we can do, folks? Isn't there? I spoke to uh, 
uh, someone that's involved with the Pennock uh, city, and apparently Pennock carries a special policy to help out in that case. They do limit it to $10,000 maximum, but at least there's something there to when the liability, you know, when the city sewer backs up so they can take care of it. Mr. Holland, can we look into it and see uh, if we can buy an insurance policy that would allow us to do something like that? Oh, I can look into that. I would just say that, and I understand your good intentions, and I understand and I empathize with their problem, but when you start overturning uh, the, the claims that our insurance company recommends, then you get to a point where you don't have an insurance company. And when you talk about can't we help out the taxpayers well we have to help out all the taxpayers because what if we lost our insurance liability then that would affect everyone in this community with higher rates and higher cost and so sometimes some people you know end up you know with the burden as you know in this individual case but if we tried to overturn this one individual case then we can have a litany of other cases down the road, and then we would be shooting ourselves in the foot. I don't know. It's all hypothetical, though, isn't it? So, but I will look into that and see if that there's some type of contingency fund that can be set aside at the same time keeping our liability insurance available. So, yeah, see if we have something like that. And uh, some of our seasoned staff members, are you aware of uh, the city ever covering any of the expenses similar to this? Okay. So, and, and so these happen, uh, you know, sad to say these happen occasionally, not, I'm pleased to say they don't happen a lot, um, but they do happen occasionally. And uh, at this point, we're not able to make any motions because we're in a work session. If we would move something into the work session, we certainly could do that. Is there additional discussion that anybody would like to have? Councilman Plowman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thanks for coming today and, and making us aware of this problem. We know that it's uh, not pleasant. I think all of us sitting here can imagine if we were in your shoes. Um, my folks now within the past year have dealt with the same issue happening at their home twice. Now, it's a relatively new home in a relatively new part of town. Um, upon jetting the pipes, it was hard for them to determine whether it was on their property or the city side of the property. So they said, well, it's a, it's a real gray area. So they decided to, to go ahead and, and jet it and do the repairs. And, and the repairs, fortunately, were covered um, underneath their homeowner's policy. Ours, Our ours homeowners would, wouldn't cover it because they said it was because of the city sewer. And uh, to be covered at all, I had to carry a special <coughs> rider, which I put on sense. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, so that was that was that was the one point, and then my I guess that kind of leads to my and, question then. And even the rider, it will only cover up the ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars, the best one you can get. Sure, um, that leads to my question then regarding uh, backflow valves. Where generally are the backflow valves on the city's end of the system? Do we have them installed incrementally? What do they? Uh, how are they located? Where? How do they function? Just for our general so knowledge. Sean, you want to answer that question, please? Sure, Mayor, Councilmember Plowman. The, uh, any backflow preventer on the sanitary system is private. Um, I've talked to a number of people that actually have a drop-in in, in the, their trench, their drain in the, in the basement, floor drain, and go right in there. Um, there are some that can be added <clears throat> at the time of construction, but they're considerable cost and uh, would act absolutely increase the cost of all the construction when we do that and uh, on, on new construction, and it would require obviously digging up the street to reinstall them all in the existing construction, but the city doesn't have any backflow that are city-owned backflow preventers. Okay, would you, I mean, would you suggest, like if you were building a new house, for example, um, would you suggest that's something that's a smart idea if finances allow? Uh, Council Member Plowman, based on what I've heard the cost of those drop-in ones are on the floor drain, um, they're very minimal cost, and I would, you know, if, if there's a concern, I would put one in. Well, and just like I said, after going through what, what my parents experienced, I mean, I, I saw, you know, what, while they were dealing with it, and I know it was an ordeal, we had, we had 
we had sheetrock cut out and we had flooring all ripped up and we had fans and we had a mess in there and it was months until their basement got looking normal again and i can only imagine the 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 additional burden uh if there wasn't insurance in place and um i guess it's it's unfortunate when we get caught in a situation where it's uh, we have an insurance policy in place, and uh, and we have to. We're stuck in between a rock and a hard place, is what we are. And we can make exceptions, but the problem is, is when we make an exception, that sets a precedent. So I think there's no um, caring for the people, <laughs> and that's where it's so sad is that you don't really care whether we've had the damage or don't. You can say you do, but you don't, and that's where. It hurts <laughs> because I look around the city and I see all that you do. And if I was probably a different nationality or something, maybe I, okay. But because I'm not, and we pay our taxes, we, we pay the sewer. I don't think you've ever, I don't think we've ever been late a day. And we pay for all of it. And it's just, you know, the taxpayer is, is an, Nobody. So, so basically, you end up paying to have your basement filled with sewage. Yeah. Will the city administrator take a look at it and find out if we can get this writer for the city? And then, uh, Mr. It doesn't help us for you to get a writer for people in the future. So, I understand and I appreciate that so that people don't have to go through it because it's not a nice thing. Right. The stench is unbearable. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I know when we talked at that meeting that, that day, um, Mr. Johnson, um, you know, we had our we had our basement too, and so yeah, so we'll need to look into that. So thank you very much for bringing the concern to us, Councilmember Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just recently, uh, last year, um, when we're building new homes, if the lowest floor drain in your home is below the street level, you have to put in, we have to install these backflow valves. Um, so the, the state and the uh, federal guidelines have, have raised uh, or that issue and uh, we're required to do it from now on. And you, you can put one in. Um, it, it might be costly, but uh, I would advise it, um, at least looking into it so that it wouldn't happen again. And they do work. Um, we've put them in down in Randall County. We had to put them in, well, for 20 years, long time, quite a long time. And they do, they do work, so uh, I would suggest checking into at least check with the local plumber and see what they can do for you thank you next on the agenda agenda is the gail hawkinson assessment amount and uh ms hawkinson hello everybody uh, the assessments that i'm going to talk to you about are deferred agricultural assessments and I just want to read a little bit about my family history with Wilmer. It goes way back. The Hawkinson family sold the land for the new school in Wilmer for the amount of $800,000, the price they were allocated for the 24 acres that they required. When I spoke with Jeff Holm, I told him our family would sell our 24 acres for the $800,000 as there are several teachers in our family and it would be a good fit. I was told by the other landowners that the city wanted us to give our land away to this school and my family not only sold the 24 acres for $800,000, but we did give eight acres of our land to the city for free for a total of 32 acres. I understand that the school might be selling some of this extra land and that the money will be put towards the expense of the school, which is a good thing for all of us. My grandma Hawkinson was born in the old Schoberg house across the bypass from this property. There's an old log cabin under the siding and additions on that house, and that is where she was born. She purchased this farm that you are assessing over 100 years ago. Since then, there have been roads put across it, ditches, storm sewers, the main gas line for the city of Wilmer, the bypass, the bypass off-ramp, and now the east side will be flooded for the storm water for the city of Wilmer. Now to the assessments on this land. Just a note, these assessments are from 12 to 27 years old. I'm supposed to call the city clerk to get the amount of assessments due when I have a buyer interested in the land so I can use that number in my sale agreement. I called Judy in October 2016 to get a number for the 2016 assessments that I had an interested buyer. I was given the number of $211,244.65. 
which was good until the end of the year. I didn't understand at the huge increase from 2015 to 2016 and said that to Judy and said I would question that number later with the assessor. In March of 2017, I called Judy again as I was once again working with the same buyer. I was told they didn't have a number for 2017. I needed a number to use on the purchase agreement. Was told to use the previous year's assessments, which is what has happened in the past. I've used the previous year because they hadn't changed. Or maybe they went down. The number was $211,244.45, which I did. Judy states that the number was good until May 1, 2017. I do not recall that being said to me. There was never, there's never been a May 1 deadline ever in the past. My buyer and I had fully executed purchase agreement on April 7, 2017. Of course, using the only assessment number we had. The closing date is June 23, 2017. The buyers needed this amount of time to get their due diligence completed, surveys, soil borings, uh, architecture, and get their information to the proper city departments, planning, zoning, and city council. The city knew that I had this purchase agreement and that the buyers and myself were using the $211,244 as the assessment amount. My son-in-law works and does for all the bidding for Mark Sand and Gravel in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. He bids against Dunnick, Knife River, and the rest of the contractors that do bidding for Wilmer. I check in with him from time to time to see where the bids are at. When I asked him about the 2016 bids, he informed me that they were about the same as 2015 and that the 2017 bids had almost gone down 10%. So of course I figured that the 2017 bids would be down and I would make our assessments down from the 211,000. I was planning on my buyers realizing a decrease in the assessment price. I never imagined that they would be going up. I will read a short statement from mm -hmm. Justin Rodeman. It's from Mark Sand and Gravel to whom it may concern. Mark Sand and Gravel Company is an asphalt paving and aggregate contractor based in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. We service Minnesota from the Canadian border to as far south as Marshall, Minnesota, and also service eastern North Dakota. We are experienced in heavy highway, municipal, commercial, and private construction. The industry pricing for many aspects of construction, including paving, stayed consistent from 2015 to 2016. However, the pricing in 2017 has decreased approximately 10% from the previous years. This reduction is due to lower fuel costs, lower asphalt cement costs, and a very competitive market. Judy called me on May 18, 2017, to inform me that the new assessment number for 2017 would be $246,823.40, a $35,578.75 increase. I didn't receive the notice letter until May 20th. I was livid. Poor Judy. <laughs> the city didn't even make their own deadline of May 1st, and now it's June 5th. These bids were to stay the same or go down in 2016, according to Curly Whitman's statement before the City Council in December 18, 2015 meeting. I'll read that statement. Whitman discussed the report with the committee Tuesday and said details will be prepared after the council orders the improvements. He said the estimated costs are similar to those used in 2015. However, he hopes the city will see a decrease in bid prices from road construction contractors because the price of oil, which is a major factor in bituminous paving, is down. Exactly what my son-in-law said. What I had experienced in the past was what I was explained how these bids work is if the bids that come into the entire city for the projects that year, if they go up 5% and I have a buyer, then my assessment goes up 5%. If the bids for these projects come in 5% less for the year, then my assessments go down 5% less. To have my family assessment go up 25% since 2015 when the bids actually went down or stayed the same is criminal in my mind. Also the frontage on all the Lakeland Avenue projects will need to be adjusted by subtracting 108.01 feet as that amount was taken for the off-ramp land that was taken off of this property. We are being assessed for 1,143.46 feet. We only own 1,035.45 feet. Um, I got a letter from an attorney that addresses some of this. And Project 9101, for the assessments that you've hit me with this year, it would be 86,000, 
$8,650.52, and from Project 9002, $3,911.22 for a total of $12,561.74, which would be less using the 2015 assessment values. <clears throat> I have a letter from the attorney that I've hired to represent our family in this case, Briggs and Morgan. You want me to read the whole thing or I suppose? You can paraphrase it or it's your choice or whatever you Special choose. assessments for parcel 95924-0020. Dear council members, I write on behalf of the Hawkinson Land LLC regarding Hawkinson, regarding the city of Wilmers City proposed increase in defined special assessments for this property identified as parcel number 95924-0020. As originally approved by the Wilmer City Council, as assessments were in the amount of 35,000, I'm gonna give you guys copies of these so I don't wanna read them all, but those are the original assessments from 90 through 2005. City's agricultural land exemption policy and alleged current cost increases to the property deferred special assessments. Relying on the city's policy agricultural land exemption, city has calculated an increase to the property's deferred special assessments since at least December 14, 2015. Uh, policy W, agricultural land exemption. It shall be the policy of the city of Wilmer to temporarily exempt assessments certain lands currently used for agricultural purposes. Real estate consisting, this is the um, resolution two on the original agreement when this was done. Real estate consisting of five acres or more shall be eligible for assessment exemption if it is actively and exclusively devoted to agricultural use as defined. Real property shall be considered to be an agricultural use provided that it is devoted by the owner of the said real property of raising of crops, forage, produce, fruits, horticulture, nursery stock, or the production of livestock, poultry, livestock, poultry <coughs> products. Real property which is enrolled in a government conservation or set-aside program shall also be considered as agricultural use. In all cases, the temporary exemption shall be deemed to have expired at such time as the property is platted or developed. For sewer and water projects, the tapping fee shall be charged at the time of connection or when the final plat is approved. These tapping fees shall be based on the project year bid price per front foot or unit or the current year cost at the time of connecting platting, whichever is greater. For street projects, assessments will be charged when the property is developed or when the final plat is approved, underlined. These assessments shall be based on the project year bid price per front foot or unit, or on the current cost at the time of developing platting, whichever is greater. Useful life shall not be considered in the calculation. City apparently calculates the above referred current cost using the yearly percentage increase in bids received on other projects similar to the project for which the assessments were originally made. Allegedly relying on current costs on the December 14, 2015 city calculated the amount of the project's deferred special assessments as 42,408, 61,518, 15,779, now I sound like an auctioneer, 64,506 or a total of 184,211. Allegedly relying on the current costs on October 20, 2016, the city calculated the amount of the property's deferred special assessments as 4459, 79, 70,940, 21,059, 74,385, or a total of 211, 244,065 cents, the number I was told to use. And approximately a 13% increase over 2015's current cost, which, as Curly had stated, we're going to stay the same or go down but they raised us up 13%. City calculated the amount of the property's deferred special assessments for a total of $246,823.40, an approximate 25% increase over 2015's current cost, and approximately 14% increase over 2016's current cost. All the contractors I called about bids going up or down from 16 to 17, they all told me they went down and I can get statements from them, I just didn't have time. City's legal and factual flaws in this calculations of the property special assessments. First, it is clear from the city's policy W that the city is calculating the property special assessments using Hawkinson's alleged proportionate share of the hypothetical 2017 current cost to the city. But Minnesota law expressly requires that such special assessments be calculated based upon the benefits received by a property from a city improvement and there's all the statutes. 
Second, while Minnesota Statute 429.071 permits City Council to make supplemental assessments to correct omissions, errors, or mistakes in the assessment relating to the total cost of the improvement or any other particular, there is simply no legal basis or justification for City's annual increase in special assessments for a property based upon the hypothetical increases or current costs. There has been no alleged omission, error, or mistake in City Council's original assessment against the property and there is thus no basis for their supplementation. City's factual flaws. First, city calculation of the property special assessments based on 1,143.46 in the footage of Lakeland Drive Southeast is erroneous as reflected on the enclosed survey and I will leave that with Judy. The property's footage along Lakeland Drive Southeast is in fact 1,035.45. Uh, and then I kind of addressed that in my letter. Uh, it would be and this year's calculation is $12,561 difference less on the 2015 assessments. Second, city's contention that 2017 current costs of the 90, 91, 92, and 05 improvements for which special assessments have been made against the property increased from 2015 is simply inaccurate. As reflected in the enclosed letter, the current cost of many aspects of construction, including paving, has decreased approximately 10%. Due to lower fuel costs, lower asphalt concerns, and a very competitive market. Indeed, in the 2018 2015 newspaper article, city engineer Curly Whitman expressed his hope that bid prices in 2016 would decrease from 2015 uh, because of the price of oil, which is a major factor in bituminous paving, is down. Put simply, city's connection that current costs increased in 2017 is not grounded in fact. Indeed, Hawkinson believes firmly that the production of the city's 2017 bid proposals and contracts will reflect a decrease in current costs from those calculated by the city in 2015. Proposed resolution. Despite the legal issues with city's proposed calculation of the property's special assessment using alleged current costs rather than the improvement contemporaneous special benefits to the property, and two, the likely decrease in current costs from 2015 to 2017, Hawkinson proposes that the City Council make a final assessment in the amount of $184,211.75 against the property. The alleged current cost is calculated in 2015. And then we'd have to take off the less footage on Lakeland Drive. The sale of this property to Schwitters will be a huge asset to the City of Wilmer. Taxes way better than agricultural land, both property and sales. All the utilities will be hooked up. More buyers coming to town to purchase cars and other merchandise and their dealership will be beautiful. I just can't understand why the city would be doing this. I am certainly not asking for special treatment, only fair and honest treatment, which all your citizens deserve. Mr. Scott, have you received a copy of the letter as of yet? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I have not received it, so I would definitely need some time to review the legal arguments that Ms. Hawkinson's attorney is making. Thank you. Mayor, I think I'd make the recommendation at this time that we allow our legal uh, attorney to uh, review this before we make any comments or discussion and come back and bring this up. Yeah, I didn't realize that we were being served with uh, legal papers. Right, uh, Councilmember Christians. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to be make make sure we all understand. What's going on? From from what I understand, what she's saying is, the the um, deferred assessment that needs to be paid was was increased after you signed the contract. Yes. By thirty five some thousand, yes. some odd dollars. Yes. So. So it's about when we close. I think you're voting on these things tonight, which is June fifth, and when we close on June twenty third. You are asking us to pay $35,700 more for, what, a month or no, not even from tonight. It's the 23rd that it closes. So I think our, I think our legal staff 
Is the legal staff in agreement that we should not be discussing this tonight until we have a chance to go through it? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, just so you know, I had reviewed what's in your packet, so I reviewed the correspondence before tonight. Uh, it appeared from that that the counselor, that the uh, staff had been applying your assessment policy uh, under the letter of that policy, which is, of course, what staff should be doing. You apparently have a letter that has been addressed to the city council from Ms. Hawkinson's attorney, and uh, I will obviously need some time to review the arguments they're making. It appears that they're questioning whether the either the policy itself or at least the manner in which staff is interpreting it is consistent with the state statute that allows for agricultural exemptions from special assessments. So I would obviously need some time to review and give the council an opinion on whether the attorney's argument is correct or what the city council's options are to deal with this situation. And I just got that letter today, so I'm <laughs> kind of reviewing it I myself. <laughs> but my guess, one of my other questions is when the last two years this has occurred that, I don't know, they're using these numbers from random street bids that come in during the city. When I was always told in the past that it's how much those bids are up or down from the previous year, not exact numbers plugged from one bid to my assessment, but in general, did they go up, did they go down? If they went down, I shouldn't be charged 25% more. Uh, again, I, I'm I want to make sure I understand. You, you, you're looking to recoup or to to uh, not pay that additional thirty-five thousand because you yes you, your contract was based upon this two eleven that uh, yes that you received from City Hall yes and the attorney thinks so, it should go back to one eighty four, but what I'm and I want to do this tonight. You know, this is the night we got to move ahead with this sale, and I think that's beneficial to all of us. Um, I'm asking. I'm not even asking for the 184. I'm asking go back to the number that was given to me when I wrote out a legal binding contract with this buyer that wants to build on this property. And that number was the 211. The 211. But also off of that number, we do have to subtract for the less footage that we're being assessed for. Because we only own, and I gave the survey to Judy, we only own 1,035, not the 11. You know, it's 108 feet less that got taken off for the ramp that came on the south side of our property. So if you can make that happen, we can move ahead with this because this 2017 thing is just, <laughs> it's not right. If I, if, you know, then say to these people that are using these deferred egg things that, you know, if we have a given number for a purchase agreement, then stick with that during that purchase agreement period. Don't just throw in something, uh, you know, a month before I'm supposed to close. And then I've been told, well, go back to the buyer. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I have a legal and moral obligation to stand by the deal I have with my buyer. I'm not going to start asking them for more money when that isn't what any of us understood. So can we even make a decision? I mean, we can't do anything because Mr. Scott wants to... Uh well, I guess, um, Mr. Mayor, if it's all right, I would ask a question of the city clerk. Procedurally, would your process be that this assessment would be included on the roll that's to be adopted today during the <coughs> regular meeting? Um, Robert, that is. this is this project was past projects. It has nothing right. to do so with the assessment hearing adopted, so tonight. That's, that's what I thought. So yeah. I don't think that the urgency to okay. have the council approve a. a essentially a settlement here. Okay. I thought this tonight. had to do, be done before it was think, voted on. That's why I had to sign that thing to give to the city, and I didn't know what I... <laughs> I think that you have... I mean, you said your closing date is on June, June 23rd. 23rd. The council yes. does meet one time before your 19th. June 23rd meeting on the 19th. Okay. Uh, that should give us time to analyze your attorney's arguments and formulate a recommendation to the council okay. for action on the 19th. Does anybody else have any questions? So, Mr. Scott, just so that you understand what she's asking for is she's asking to pay the 211, 244.65. And there were three different numbers in that document. I didn't write all of them down, but there's three different numbers in that document. I, I understand the request. Minus that footage that we don't own anymore. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, right. and obviously, Mayor, I'll have to work with staff a little bit to get all the background from the staff's perspective as well as what you presented. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, next uh, we have Mr. John Heron from the Utilities. Consider waiving mechanical permit fees for district heat customers. Mr. Heron. Thank you, Mayor, Council members. Just a uh, second. Mr. Ms. Hawkinson, uh, just thank you for coming and bringing this to us. Um, I, I meant to thank you for that and bring, making us aware of this situation, and, and uh, we'll have our staff take a look at it. We probably would have a lot more questions, but when we get a, a notice filed with us, we're much more reluctant to make comments, so we'll have to wait for the legal interpretation from our legal staff. So thank you. We look forward to the project. I think it will be a great project for that part of Wilmer. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing that. Yeah, thank Aaron. you. Uh, this evening with me is Wilmer Utility Commission Commissioner Carol Lamar, also uh, Chairman of the Utility Commission. Tonight I'd like to provide uh, a quick update uh, on the status of the district heat and the progress we're making in addition to uh, touch on the waiving of the mechanical permit fees. Since I've been in front of the Commission here uh, last time, the Commission on May 22nd held two public hearings. The first public hearing was for the decommissioning of the district heating system, and the second public hearing was for the financial assistance program that the Commission is considering. A uh, number of customers attended. Two spoke at the first public hearing. Both spoke in favor of decommissioning the district heat. At the second meeting, one customer had a couple questions regarding the details of the financial assistance program. The Commission proceeded with adopting the required resolutions to continue the process. Resolutions are in your Council packets this evening. Uh, the next step in the process is for the Council tonight to give consideration to setting the public hearings for the decommissioning process as well as the financial assistance program. Uh, the Commission is requesting that the Council set those public hearings for June 19th, which would be the next Council meeting. Uh, at that meeting, uh, upon uh, completion of the public hearings, there would be a requirement to adopt the two resolutions, one discontinuing the district heat, one um, concurring with the financial assistance program that the Utility Commission has set up. With the adoption of those two resolutions, the date uh, would be then determined for the decommissioning date of the district heat. If the council were to move forward tonight at its council meeting to set those hearings, uh, the utility commission would work with Mr. Scott in setting up or in drafting the public notices that need to be uh, published as well as resolutions that would need to be adopted at the conclusion of those public hearings. Is there any questions on the status before we move into the mechanical permit piece? Okay, thank you. Uh, in your packet tonight, uh, there's a request to consider waiving the mechanical permit fees retroactive to February 1st of 2017, which is the date that the Commission announced that the district heat could potentially be decommissioned. On behalf of the district heat customers and contractors, I'm asking the Council to give consideration to waiving the mechanical permit fees. On multiple occasions, this request has been made by dif different customers and different contractors. Uh, the request was discussed with the City Building Code Department and it was decided to present the request to the City Council for consideration. Request in your packet identifies the revenues that would be generated from the residential conversion. Commercial is unknown as it's based on a percentage of the cost for the conversion which is 1% of the, of the cost of the project uh, with a minimum fee on any given permit of $90. Uh, request excludes waiving the state fees that go along with the mechanical permits. Uh, I understand the requests presented at the work session are placed on future council meeting agendas for consideration. So this could be placed on uh, the meeting, the next council meeting, June 19th, if and when the district heating meetings are held, we could uh, wrap this request for me mechanical permit fees to be waived as well, whether the Council wishes to waive or not to waive them. Uh, is there any questions with, uh, with the request? Uh, Fernando, followed by Ron. So what I'm understanding, um, based on your financial impact, you're saying that there's 133 
um, parties or residents that would be affected and we would lose $4,123? That would be correct based on the information uh, that we were given for the permit fees and the number of customers that, uh, residential customers that were on this system, uh, February 1st, that would be the correct number. Okay. Is there any advantage to um, having a, a deadline date on this or anything like that as an incentive or? The deadline date, in my opinion, would be the date that's set for decommissioning the district heat. Okay. <clears throat> Councilmember Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a quick comment and to notice that we're uh, once again bending the rules, our own policy, which we should be con consider the, the people that we're after the, for the sewer problem, man. We're, we're bending the rules here. Uh, they're a guideline, and we've done it before. And uh, just want to remind you that we can do that as a council. We can, we can bend all the rules that are set before us, whether they're uh, ordinances, guidelines, or, or policies, um, and we're doing it now if we uh, go along with this request. Councilman Fagerly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We did it, you know, when we had the storm last year, we Thank waived you. the fees. But you're doing it because you're eliminating the district heat for a reason. So you'll make a profit have less expenses. I would think you should cover all of them for your customers that are leaving instead of the city itself. I may, I'm here in front of the council at the request of our, of the customers that attended our informational meetings as well as the contractors and they asked if the council would consider waiving those fees. And uh, that's why I'm in front of you tonight sharing that information with you. Uh, the wishes of the council, uh, you know, the council has to vet out that request and make a recommendation <laughs> or a decision, you know, back to the utility commission regarding your position. No, I have no problem with waiving it, but it uh, would seem that uh, you're that one, you're the one that wants them to move on, so you should pay the fee to the city. And it's, that's a discussion of the council. I mean, if that's okay. your recommendation back to the commission, I will carry that back to the commission. Right, that's fine. Yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm here on behalf of our customers and contractors uh, at their request to present this request to the commission or to the council. They asked if, if that could be done. I said, I don't know. We discussed it with staff. Staff said that would be left up to the council if they want to make a change to that. And that's why we're here, yeah, or that's why I'm here in front of the council tonight. All right, so, thanks. But thank you. Councilmember Nelson. John, John, can either you or staff address what it will cost the commercial, what would the commercial fees, and is there a particular project or something that we could can anybody give us an estimate on what we might be thinking? You we talked about that with the uh, planning department a little bit, and there's no way of knowing that number. Uh, there's, it's early in the stages. Very few, if any, have firm quotes yet for the conversion, so we don't know, know that number, but it'll be sizable. 1% One, 1 of project costs will add up, but yeah, we have no way of indicating or knowing what that is at this point in time in the process. I just have a couple comments as the mayor. Um, I agree that when we did it last time, there were extenuating circumstances. We had a flood in our community. A lot of people were affected by that. We were in a public safety crisis at that point, and we wanted to do everything we could to make sure that our citizens could get heat back in their homes or air conditioning or hot water or whatever the case is. This is a different situation. Um, we're talking about something totally different than something just being you know, coming, you know, eight inches or 10 inches or 12 inches of rain, however much you want to say it was. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, at this point, I would not be in favor of waiving those fees. I think that those fees are something that certainly could be put into budgets. Uh, as Council Member Fagley said, maybe that's something that the commission needs to look at. Do they put that into their cost basis when they're looking at what it costs to, to convert this over? So. Uh, those are my opinions, and um, I guess that's what I'd leave you with. So, thank you. Any other, any additional questions? 
Yes, if I may, uh, Mayor Kelvin. Uh, will this be placed on a future council meeting for official action, or is it the opinion in the work session here that stands that the commission is turning this back over to the utility com or the council is turning this back over to the utility commission? Uh, the, the process would be is that if you want to pursue this, you would bring it back to Mr. Holland. Mr. Holland would place it on a future agenda. Um, I think you had three or four opinions here. Um, you know, there obviously was no vote taken. When you, uh, when you cast the vote, that's, that's when the decision is made. Correct. Until the council's uh, made that vote, it's just an opinion. Okay. Uh, and the reason I ask that is uh, we had submitted the request for council consideration. Uh, so I'm just trying to understand the process or the policy for this. So. If you, if you put it in as a council request to move forward and you continue to move it forward, it will be on our next agenda on, on June 19th for okay. formal action. Today was here, taking it for information. Okay. The next meeting we'd vote on it. Okay. So if that's what you wish to do, that's how it will handle. So we need we to resubmit it if that's the wishes. No, you don't need to resubmit it. You just need to tell Mr. Holland that you want it on the agenda. Okay. And that will be placed on the agenda. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, then quick recap for tonight's meeting. There will be two public hearings set, I understand, based on the agenda. Uh, one for the decommissioning and one for the financial uh, policy that is part of the decommissioning process. So uh, is there a need? for me to stay for the council meeting or what's, otherwise I will, I will part. Yeah, we're setting the public hearings, what we're doing. It'd be the only thing is if, if council has questions of Mr. Heron, um, he's asking if he should stick around if we're gonna have questions. He doesn't wanna, we talked before the meeting started. He doesn't want to leave if you're going to have a bunch of questions, but he understands it's as simple as setting the public hearing. And I said, we'll talk about it at the end with your presentation and see what council wishes. But um, certainly, if we have questions that come up, Mr. Holland can get a hold of you tomorrow. Okay. So, but it does not appear that there'll be questions at this point. But again, we don't know until the vote is taken. Sure. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Have thank you for evening. being here. Carol, thank you for being here as well. Appreciate that. Next is the Minnesota Nurses Association comments on the hospital. Uh, who's here to represent the nurses? My name is Karen Jansen and I live in Kirkhoven. So I'm not a, but I've worked at Rice. Can you pull down the spike? Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, hello everyone, I'm glad to be here. Um, I've worked for Rice Hospital for 34 years. It'll be 35 years in September. Um, I have always been proud to say that I work for Rice Hospital. Um, and I've worked on many units in the hospital, so if I look familiar, <laughs> I may have taken care of you after surgery or after you've had a baby or if your child has been sick too. Um, and I'm concerned about the quality of patient care that we provide that um, we're concerned, many of us are concerned about maintaining the level of patient care that, we've, that we have been able to experience and safe patient care. Um, we've heard things from other people who work for center care or other organizations where um, nurses have had to work mandatory double shifts. For instance, if they work a 12 hour shift and they need extra nurses, they are required to stay. They have no choice about it. Um, other things that we've heard too is that if they're working 12 hour shifts, the, the um, organization, if they are not union, they can tell them they work the first four hour shifts, first four hours of their shift, and then they have to go home for four hours, but they still have to come back at, at 3 p.m. to work for another four hours. Um, and that is not always safe, and especially with the mandatory overtime shifts too, if you've worked 12 hours, you guys know what it's like to work at your job for a long period of time, and it's not safe to have somebody working, you know, double shifts if they're not feeling up to it or um, don't feel like that's safe for patient care. Um, we are concerned because um, what does center care gain from this taking over of the hospital. I know it's not being sold, but we're wondering what it means that they're in affiliation. Does that mean they're leasing the hospital? Does that mean they're 
in charge of everything, that they take over everything. And I think um, it's important that you guys check into all of this and don't just um, say, okay, because of the money issues and because of physician recruitment, it's okay. Because I feel like um, lots of patients are very satisfied with the care they get at Rice Hospital and we wanna continue that too. Um, because that does reflect on the city of Wilmer, whether they're happy at you know getting care at Rice Hospital, um, as well as the employee satisfaction working here too. Um, so I guess I guess the main thing is to for you guys to find out what center care gains from this, because they have to be gaining something or they wouldn't be interested in it too. And Rice Rice has employs 900 employees. Not all nurses, but all, that's kind of overall what they tell us in orientation that they employ 900 employees. That does affect a lot of people, affects our livelihood, affects um, you know how we feel about our job too. So I guess I, my challenge to you is that you research and talk to other city hospitals that have been taken over by a corporation and find out what their experiences have been and find out you know, if they've been happy with doing that or if they feel like they've lost services. Um, I did hear about a hospital that was taken over by a corporation and they had just built a new OB unit and they decided that they weren't gonna use that OB unit. They were going to ship all their other patients off to another hospital and um, change what they were doing. So. You know, sometimes I wonder if center care isn't thinking about saying, okay, Rice doesn't, doesn't need to do such and such, so we'll send all those kind of patients to St. Cloud or to some other hospital. Um, they could even do that with a lot of intensive care patients here. They could say, okay, we want to send, are going to send our patients to St. Cloud because that's the way we want to do it and we make more money that way. So... I guess, I guess my challenge is to you to research and talk to other city hospitals and find out what benefits and what pitfalls there are and how it impacts the care of the patients here in our community and in surrounding communities as well as the employees. And thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I have one question for you. You referenced a comment about closing an OB unit. Was that in Minnesota or was that another state? That was in Minnesota down in the cities, Unity Hospital. Okay. The other thing that, you know, that, you know, the, the council needs to look at this and, you know, at this point we have a letter of intent is all that we have in front of the council. Mm -hmm. The details aren't out yet that yep. we've seen. And the thing of it is that that's important to me as the mayor for the city of Wilmer is that we have good quality care right here being provided locally. And so that good quality care is going to be a key indicator on how I look at it and how I would give right. an opinion on that. So I think that our concerns are similar. Regional care for us mm -hmm. and having that ability to recruit physicians but also to have good quality patient care is going to be very important. Right. And, and safe care. Members. And safe care, too. Correct. You know, that's, you don't want... That's nurses, good quality. That's good quality. You don't quality. want nurses having, having six patients because that, you can't really give safe care to six patients at a time either. Any, any other council members wish to make a comment? Thank you. And that's why we bring it up is because we want you guys to be thinking of these things because if you don't hear it from us, you won't hear it from, you know, certain other people, you know, because they only give their side of the story. So thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Next is consideration of a resolution for municipal consent uh, for the Y Highway 12 portion of the Y project. Mr. Peterson. Council, we are getting near the end of the Y project um, planning portion and the agreement portion. And as part of that project, changes are being made to the alignment and the geometrics of US Highway 12. Under Minnesota statutes, there's a process called municipal consent whereby cities are allowed to have public hearings to consider <coughs> highway changes and are given the opportunity to approve or disapprove that particular portion of the project little bit of history that the changes to the Highway 12 realignment came about as part of the review of alternatives for the highway portion of the Y project. 
The alignment as proposed, the realignment as proposed will bring Highway 12 south of the existing corridor and will provide opportunity for better industrial park access while improving traffic flow for the general motoring public. This project is at a point where MnDOT is working through the municipal consent process. Uh, tonight we have Paul Rasmussen from MnDOT. He's the project manager and he can answer your technical questions about this whole process and the project itself. There have been numerous public hearings and public meetings conducted as part of the Y project. It's the opinion of staff that no additional hearings are required <coughs> just to discuss the highway changes. And as a project partner, I don't believe any further con uh, consent is needed on the part of the city. The highway realignment does require right of way from the city of Wilmer as well as a number of private landowners. There's a couple issues in front of us and uh, they're not very significant. The alignment and geometry have received significant scrutiny by the project partners as well as the general public at a variety of meetings. If we do not waive the municipal consent process, it could result in delays and a change in expectations by the city of Wilmer. There's really no financial impact on the city in granting the waiver. The financial impact of the city comes in the form of the right of way that we are going to be transferring to MnDOT for the highway realignment. You have a sheet that was circulated around to you that briefly lays out the municipal consent process and I'll just go over that very quickly with you. Uh, MnDOT would have the final layout submitted to the city with a letter requesting that the city approve the layout. Mr. Peterson, can we get you a little closer, please? Sorry. I can try to do that. Um, the next step in the process would be that the city would hold a public hearing and give 30-day minimum public notice of the hearing, and then uh, MnDOT would present that layout at the hearing. The city council then would pass a resolution approving or disapproving the layout and that would be the uh, process of actually granting municipal consent. Um, the city can choose to waive that particular process, and in that case, the council can pass a resolution that identifies a project and waiving its right to municipal consent. Um, it's a recommendation of staff that the council proceed with the formal action on the matter of municipal consent at the June 19th city council meeting. Uh, again, I do not believe that there's need for additional public hearings with regard to the street portion of this project uh, or the highway portion. It's been very well explained, very well vetted, and uh, very well communicated on by the public. Um, I'd like to be able to call on Mr. Rasmussen so he could discuss a few issues with the council and go over the alignment and uh, some of the geometrics with the council. Mr. Rasmussen. Mayor Calvin, council members, thank you for the opportunity to come here tonight and uh, talk about municipal consent. I believe you had um, some drawings that were in your packet that contained the uh, a lot, uh, layout and uh, also bold in, in there is the uh, city um, limits. Um, we don't have any drawings there. Yeah, we, don't, we, we were not given the drawings. Oh. Up on the screen. Okay, I did make copies of them. Bruce, could you see that we get those, please? Um, I will say it, it hasn't changed significantly since the last time we presented here to the council. Uh, Highway 12 will uh, separate from its current alignment uh, right about 28th Street um, near the Coca-Cola bottling plant. Um, they're right at the Hawk Creek crossing. Uh, come across the, that is the city piece of uh, ground owned by the city. They're on the north side of Hawk Creek. Uh, it'll cross County Road 5, just about 650 feet south of the current um, signal at at County Road 5 and Highway 12. Um, this has the benefit of right now the, the signal and the uh, rail crossing arms are very tight together. So this brings that down a little bit. It'll continue to the uh, west 
curves a little bit to the south, and then we cross the railroad um, there just 600 feet east of County Road 55. And then it takes a turn curve back to the north where it ties back into Highway 12 at uh, out at 7th Avenue, which is uh, old Highway 12. This is the version of, this is, uh, has been referred to as alternate 2B. Um, and it does not include the at grade crossing at 1st Avenue, which has been a controversial point that I'm sure most of you are aware of. Um, because of that, there's a, a frontage road that ties 1st Avenue back down into new Highway 12. And then County Road 55 will uh, come up to meet New Highway 12 as it goes up to go over the railroad tracks. Um, the new alignment will be approximately 30 feet in the air uh, once it goes over the railroad. Is there any questions about? I know I, I don't want to leave this alone, but I know you this uh, layout is pretty much the same as you've seen in the past. Um, any changes that we've made have been very minor. Uh, radiuses at some of the intersections and uh, some changes to the length of some of the turn lanes. So is there any? Questions, specific questions about that? I I don't want to waste your time going over something you guys have have seen before. I'm I'm good with where it's at. Councilman Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple quick questions. Z, what becomes of the old Highway 12? I mean, is it going to be cut off right where you've got the uh, hash in the hashtag or? Yeah, the cross hatching will be uh, hatching. Excuse me. That's where Highway 12 will be removed. Um, the portion just east of where we take off on the east end will be removed. There will be a piece that will be left in as a driveway. Um, then the next section of Highway 12 east west of County Road 5 will be will be left as uh, access to First Avenue. Um, First Avenue will be realigned, so it actually the currently you have to turn off a of Highway 12 to go on the First Avenue. This will realign uh, that, so the piece coming from the west, you'll go straight on the First Avenue, and then uh, a little piece of existing Highway 12 will be left in place to provide access out to the Dooley's Petroleum Tank Farm. Then that next piece will be removed to allow the railroad tracks to cross, and then. Next piece will be used to tie uh, what is currently 45th Avenue to the south back around for access to uh, um, the turkey farm and west side storage and then tie back into Highway 12 over where the new 45th Street crossing will be. Okay, I, I see that. Um, then th my next question would be the, the uh, bridge is going to be going over the railway just east of 55. How much distance is there from that bridge to the uh, intersection there? There's approximately, there's 600 feet from the center line of County Road 55 to the center line of the bridge. Is that not a safety concern? No, that isn't very far coming down the hill and hitting that intersection. It, it was something we took a, a great deal, uh, a large look at. Our current intersection site distance standard would be about 800 feet. Um, we've designed this alignment to have 1,070 feet of sight distance back to the east so that as you pull up to the intersection, you'll, you'll be able to see 1,070 feet down the... Ahead of you. It, down the existing alignment on 12 to give you enough room to make curves. So 
we looked at that to make sure we increase that sight distance above the standard. Okay. We also did the same at Highway 40. You have a similar situation on uh, Trunk Highway 40 where County Road 55 comes up and stops. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. Anybody have questions on the municipal consent process? <clears throat> Do you want to speak to that uh, yeah, bit? I would, under our normal process, um, under a normal MnDOT project, we would uh, do a similar layout and uh, develop our project. And then when we got to a point where we had a signed layout, we would come to the city. And if we changed any one of three, any of three criteria, one is if we purchase right away within the city, one is if we change the uh, access, or the third one is if we um, change capacity of the highway we would be required to come to the city council for municipal consent. Um, this project is not our normal project. Instead of MnDOT out developing a project for the highway, this has been a partnership all along with the city and the county and BNSF and MnDOT. And so we've moved through the process uh, keeping everybody on board. And I, I'd like to thank the city staff for all their help as we've moved along to, developing uh, the layout and negotiating with BNSF. It's, um, so as we've moved along, we've, we're getting to the point where we have a signed layout and we're getting some of the agreements in place and uh, we're starting to get those agreements. But at this point, it's all been um, based on non-binding um, memos of understanding. So at, at any point, the city can still back out even if they waive municipal consent. And uh, certainly we don't want that to happen. We're, but there is, by waiving municipal consent, you still have the opportunity to, <coughs> to uh, it, it doesn't really change your ability to get out of the project if you were to choose to do that. Correct. Um, so I would point out in this particular case, because uh, uh, this is a partnership, um, by waiving municipal consent, municipal consent, you still have all the rights to get out of that until we, the first thing that will contractually obligate anybody is the actual uh, master, um, master agreement, which we've been negotiating for about a year and a half now, and we're getting very, very close to uh, bringing to the council to sign. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions on municipal consent? I just have one question, and this might be more of Robert or Bruce, I'm not sure, but, um, you know, if we, if we tonight would call for a public hearing on this issue and allow the public to actually have comment at the meeting on the, on the 19th so that the public, I mean, the public has had a lot of opportunity, but I certainly don't want to, I want to be as transparent as we can in this process because there's a lot of questions out there. I don't want us to jump through hoops, but at the same point, is there any way that we could do something to, you know, allow the public one more opportunity to speak to it? Mr. Peterson. Mayor Calvin, members of the council. Um, you know, there's really two different methods to go through this process. One is to set up the public hearing and actually do that with the long notice uh, period as specified mm -hmm. by, by statute. That would be a 30-day minimum notice. The reason behind my recommendation that this come back to the council on the 19th was just so the council had a couple of weeks to digest the whole concept of the waiver and it, and it would not require a public hearing. Uh, again, the opinion of staff is that there's no additional public input required for the highway portion. It's designed, it's been in front of the, the public on a number of occasions and to keep the process moving and to uh, keep these time frames under control, I think it makes more sense for the council to just uh, adopt the waiver of municipal consent resolution, and that's what would be brought to you at your next meeting without a public hearing. But we could still take public comment at that time if we chose to? The mayor and council can do whatever they want. <laughs> well, within reason. Anybody else from the council? Thank you. Mr. Rasmussen, uh, thank you for shepherding this project. You've done a great job. It's been fun watching this project come together. 
We don't have everything we want. You understand that. So we are making concessions as we move forward. And, uh, but the value of this project outweighs the uh, concerns that we've expressed to you at this point. So I believe what you're seeing by council not having questions is that we're saying continue the project. No, I appreciate that. Thank you for your time and all your help as we've moved this project uh, through to this point. Thank you. Next, we have six month priorities for the city administrator in the evaluation form. Um, we're running tight on time here. And so, Mr. Holland, uh, we're not going to have to have any filler tonight. We're going to be able to just can take I, you and move on. So. Can I have an extension of 15 minutes? I'm kidding. <laughs> you can, but you'll be talking alone. <laughs> Mr. Well, Holland. Well, everyone's on a break. Um, there's two documents um, that were included in the work session there. One is uh, an item, uh, itemized list of about 20 things. Most of them are projects. This was a list that was put together, uh, I believe, by the mayor. And it was provided to me. And when I talked to the mayor about it, he made the recommendation that we bring this before the council. Because as you know, all of you in six months will, uh, well, in five months, I've been here one month already, uh, will do an evaluation. And that's the second document is an evaluation form. And I feel like it's important that we agree on what the uh, criteria for the evaluation is now, not after the fact, because then that's when we have confusion. So uh, I've provided those, both those documents. Uh, there doesn't have to be a decision tonight. So uh, I will make the recommendation that unless someone calls me or emails me to bring this document back, that we sort of have a consensus that these are the items that we want to move forward with. Um, and I don't, after re-looking at this list, Mayor, is there anything that you want to personally highlight uh, out of these 20 items that you feel like there should be a consensus that I should make progress on or have completed within this first uh, six months? Council, are there comments that you have that you would like? Uh, you've, uh, I know we had some trouble uploading the, the documents earlier, so I'm hoping that you all had an opportunity to review this today. And uh, are, there, are there comments that, uh, that you would like to make sure that Mr. Holland addresses in his first five months now? Um, of course, we know that all these projects are not going to be completed. It's just getting the projects up and going, uh, get them moving, and these are things that we want you to work on. Of course, there's a ton of other things that are going to come in as well, but one of the things that I wanted to provide to him was kind of a framework as to where we're headed and things that we're working on so that he's not sitting there going, well, what is a council priority and what isn't? So, um, Council Member Nelson. I simply was going to request um, some additional time. I want to thank you for this document. I think it's great, but I'm wondering if we couldn't, since we didn't get our documents on time, if we couldn't just have this to review and bring it back to the next work session okay. to see if there are any additions or deletions and that you can feel there is consensus with where we're at. Okay, that's fine. So we'll bring it back in a couple of weeks. We'll give everybody a chance to look at it and, and uh, you know, make a suggestion if they need to, but I don't think we need to go into a big discussion tonight about it. Sure, Council Especially Member. since most did not even get a chance to see it until tonight, so. I apologize for that. It was, uh, as they say, blame it on the internet or whatever. That's uh, what happened. But we're going to try to put in some uh, some uh, some checks and balances there, so that uh, if you don't receive the packets on Thursday afternoon, uh, then we will know. Because, like in this instance, you know, we sent out the packets Thursday evening, assuming that everybody got them and. We didn't find out until the weekend that people did not receive them. So we'll try to put in some, uh, some checks and balances there so that doesn't happen again. But, Mayor, that's all I have, and I'll try to leave some Council time. Councilmember Christensen had a okay. comment. I just want to know, this is a list only. This isn't prioritized. No. Okay. Right. If the council wished to prioritize that, we certainly could do that. I believe that that would be something better to do at a retreat when we would set goals and vision. This is just things to be working on. Um, yeah, there's no priority to this list. Um, it was developed by 
um, Mr. McGuire and myself as we were looking at projects that had to be worked on. Of course, the 2018 budget is, will be to the top of the list. Right. So. Anything else? Okay, we're adjourned. Yay. <laughs>